So in the previous screencast, I had been talking about circulation of water and air and some of the different factors um, that alter the flow. So now I just want to briefly take a look at something that happens on the west coast of the United States, in California specifically, and it's called a rain shadow. So you have warm ocean water followed by a beach and then a gradual slope upward, which turns into a mountain. So as the prevailing winds blow in toward the coastline, um, it brings precipitation, it brings moisture to the area, which eventually forms cloud and precipitation at the near shore area. But as that air moves up the mountain, it dries and it gets colder and it dries and so the air on the far side of the mountain is arid which means very dry and then you have a desert here so an example of that if you've ever read the book or seen the movie is wild which reese witherspoon was in and i'm not recommending it as a novel uh, it's based on a true story um, but it was interesting it was a woman who decides to go on a hike up the Pacific Crest Trail and she begins in the Mojave Desert so it's very hot and dry and she continues on going through the Sierra um, Nevada mountains where she's suddenly in a snowstorm and anyway her trail continues on all the way up to the border with um, Oregon and Washington State but in that, she goes through many different types of ecosystems, and so that's why I mention it here. Okay, so now we're looking at what forms terrestrial biomes. And it's variation in climate, which remember means temperature and precipitation, which determines the dominant plant growth forms, and then therefore all of the other organisms in the, in the biome. So climate affects the distribution of species around the globe. Organisms have distinct growth forms due to adaptations to local temperature and precipitation patterns. And these form biomes or biological homes in which the presence of similar plant growth forms in an area which possesses simple, similar temperature and precipitation patterns occur. So bottom of the pyramid here, climate, which is temperature and precipitation. Then the next layer up is the presence of similar growth forms, for instance, a succulent plant in a desert versus um, a plant with pine needles or needles in a cold area to broadleaf plants in moderate areas. And then above that, um, the different organisms that depend on that type of plant. So terrestrial biomes can be divided into nine basic categories based on temperature and precipitation. So looking here at temperature going across, we have temperatures that are very cold because the biome is located near one of the poles or because the biome is located at high altitude. Then we have temperate, which would occur at a mid-latitude region, um, which would be something like we experience here in New England. And then there's tropical, which is very warm, greater than 68 degrees Fahrenheit on average. So Florida would be considered tropical, but if, excuse me, subtropical, but if we were going to simplify it just into these three, you could add Florida into the tropical region. And then in addition to being based on temperature, going downward, we have variations in precipitation Deserts, very little um, rainfall, therefore very little and very specialized vegetation, very fragile ecosystems, and typically um, low species diversity. Then we have moderate precipitations, which uh, form grasslands, and that often occurs in the interior of continents. And it's usually not so much tall trees for sure, or shrubs, more grasses and that kind of thing uh, because of seasonal drought, but it is a good area for grazing animals. And last we have forests, which are lands dominated by trees. They can be warm 
forests like tropical rainforests, uh, cold forests like boreal forest in Canada, and everywhere in between. So even though I simplified it into a nine-factor grid, in reality, the cutoff for temperature and the cutoff for precipitation is not a straight line. Let's look at temperature. You see how it's like a squiggly line here. Let's look at precipitation. You can see it's a squiggly line and a line that starts here and goes like this. So in reality, though there are these um, different types of biomes, there's a, the numbers are not hard set, but the characteristics remain the same. You can also see from this graph that the distribution of biomes across the world <clears throat> varies. So, for instance, we have, um, let's see, temperate seasonal forest in dark green right here. And yet inside there, we have temperate grasslands and cold desert right next to it in the um, middle of, the, of America, of the United States. And this is temperate because of the water factor, which we've talked about, the heat capacity, helping to maintain more temperate temperatures um, through this region and drier areas back here. All right, so let's look at each of the different biomes. First, we have a tundra. It's very cold and very treeless. There is some low-growing vegetation, and in winter, the soil is completely frozen, and that's known, that's frozen soil that underlies the subsoil is known as permafrost, because it was thought to be permanently frozen and impermeable. So when the warming season occurs and some of the um, less frozen soil at the, at the very top, at the topsoil, melts, the water will be able to support low-growing vegetation, and it will be stopped from draining further into the soil because of that impermeable permafrost or permanently frozen soil layer. Unfortunately, it's not really um, so permanent anymore with global climate change and in particular global warming. Some of the permafrost has begun to melt. For people, that's been an issue because um, many structures, including oil pipelines, are anchored into the permafrost. And so when they melt um, and the pipeline is no longer anchored, there's a risk of a spill. Um, ecologically, it's also a problem for the plants because if the permafrost does not hold and the water drains, there would not be eventually enough water to maintain that low growing vegetation. Okay, another biome, uh, terrestrial biome, is the boreal forest, and that contains mainly coniferous trees, evergreen trees. So those are trees that bear uh, cones, pine cones, for example, and have needles, Le their leaves are needles and having the very narrow leaf allows it to um, contain the heat so it doesn't lose all the heat to the atmosphere and therefore they can um, grow, but broadleaf trees cannot. So these have cold winters and short growing seasons and they're found relatively far north in latitude, 50 to 60 degrees north, and you can see they are across Canada and, let's see, where's that? Here we go, across Canada. And you can see a little bit across here in, a little bit in Europe, a little bit in Russia, um, going across all of that same latitude. And so that, that biome is, would be considered subarctic. It's very cold and plant growth is constrained by temperature but it's not as constrained by precipitation. If it was constrained by precipitation, we wouldn't have the trees, we'd have low-growing vegetation, but it is constrained by the cold temperatures. Also, the soil is poor in nutrients because um, at these cold temperatures, decomposition takes place slowly, so most of the nutrients are in the trees themselves, not in the soil. 
The next biome is a temperate rainforest. So a temperate rainforest, temperate means moderate, rain means there's going to be a great deal of precipitation, and forest means that there will be trees. So we have a moderate temperature and high precipitation coastal biome. And being a coastal biome is what helps to moderate the temperature here. Um, and this supports the growth of very large trees like sequoias. Next we have the biome that we live in, and that's a temperate seasonal forest. Temperate, again, moderate. Seasonal, so we have leaves on our trees during the summer that then um, turn to turn color and then fall off during the winter. And so this type of forest is found in the eastern United States and also portions of Europe, China, Japan, um, and even Chile and eastern Australia. So little bits all over. So it is dominated by a type of tree, you should know the name of this, I'm sorry it's not in green, but a broadleaf deciduous tree. So trees like our, our oak trees are broadleaf, they don't have needles as leaves, and they're deciduous, which means that once the summer is over and it's no longer efficient energy-wise for the tree to continue doing photosynthesis, the tree sheds its leaves and stops doing photosynthesis for the winter. Um, then when the summer um, comes around again, it's relatively warm and that favors decomposition, so soils contain a lot of nutrients, or certainly more than boreal forests. So you'll have leaf litter, you'll see um, little bits of rich material, organic material, at the base of the trees in this type of forest. So let's wrap this up here with one little fun fact about temperate seasonal forests. So these leaves are green in the summer because of a pigment known as chlorophyll, which is the pigment which facilitates photosynthesis. Once the sunlight's energy decreases as we move into fall, it's no longer ecologically, energetically efficient for these leaves to continue with photosynthesis because there's less light. So the chlorophyll goes away, it stops being produced by the leaf. And then you see within the leaf colors that were there all along. Leaves already had pigments for yellow, oranges, and reds. And now you get to see them in fall when chlorophyll is no longer produced. I'm going to wrap that one up here.